So these are all your bills this morning. Yes, so, uh, it's yours. So you can uh, suggest the order in which we take that, given people's whereabouts. Okay, and so. Um, Personal interest. Mm -hmm. Dan, what, yeah, why don't we go with with why don't we go with two, two ninety four? So Emily doesn't feel pressed for time. Are you are uh, these prepared? prepared? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we. I need so two ninety four being applicant salary history and inquiries. Two ninety four. Three. Okay. We've got a great filing system here on the floor. <laughs> we, we, we will be Jamie on this one because he, yes. he did draft some minor amendments to I think he'll be free at nine, okay. but. Good morning, committee. Uh, for the record, Dan Barlow, public policy manager with Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. Uh, we testified in support of this bill um, when it was in the House General yeah. Housing and Military Affairs Committee. And, you know, I'll be honest, before I saw the bill back in January, this wasn't an issue that, you know, my policy committee or my board really discussed too much. So uh, in anticipation that this would be a bill the legislature was interested in, I turned to my board and my policy committee and said, can, I, can you tell me about your hiring practices and, you yeah. know, what you currently do? And I was actually kind of surprised by that this was on the radar uh, for a lot of our employers and they already they already recognize the intersection of asking about salary history and how that can compound um, prior biased um, salaries in, in the past. Um, so I was actually kind of uh, pleasantly surprised that this was something that they were, as employers, that they were already thinking about. And for the most part, if they were in a long established business, they had already stopped using salary history um, as, a, as a barometer. And uh, for new and emerging businesses, this had never been part of their, uh, their hiring practices. Um, so essentially, you know, two issues rose to uh, the top when we were talking about this is, number one, our employers found that salary history provides no useful information uh, to them concerning the candidate's qualifications for a job. Uh, and again, they, they recognize that it can adversely impact candidates who have experienced pay gaps related to gender or race uh, by compounding and repeating uh, that pay gap. And uh, if I can, I'd like to uh, read a few quick remarks from members uh, of uh, VBSR about how they handled this. Uh, so first is, um, yes? And have you submitted it to Kayla electronically? Um, I'm going to clean up my copy and I'll send it right over. I'm done here. Perfect. So. Uh, the first is from Marky Reed. She's the founder of Career Networks Incorporated in Williston, and she's the chair of the VBSR board. And she said, men are statistically more likely to see their monetary value as higher than women, and they are more likely to risk a potentially awkward negotiation conversation. This often results in hundreds of thousands of dollars of lost income for women over their professional lifetimes. With more and more women being the primary wage earners for families, this is a great disservice to everyone and puts more and more families under stress. Uh, additionally, uh, I also spoke to uh, Dwayne Peterson, uh, the co-founder of Suncommon and Waterbury, and he said, uh, we state salary range and benefits and don't ask about uh, pay history. Uh, this weeds out people uh, who need more, um, having learned the lesson the hard way, getting deep into the process, exciting us about a prospective employee, uh, only then to discuss compensation and find that everyone's time has been wasted. Uh, transparency uh, early is fair to all involved and avoids the discrimination that focusing on pay history can, can perpetuate. Uh, additionally, I also talked to uh, Heather Wright, who's the co-founder of Wright Jones, an employment law firm up in Burlington. I think the committee might remember her when she came in and talked about Band the Box uh, yeah. two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I'll be honest, Heather is sometimes maybe a little more conservative on employment issues than the rest of my, my policy committee at mm -hmm. times, so I was really interested to hear what she had to say. Uh, and she said, I have been advising clients to drop this practice for years. Mm -hmm. uh, employees approach compensation in many different ways. Uh, and asking for salary history is just one piece of the puzzle and leads the new employer to make significant decisions on incomplete information. Mm -hmm. uh, this does, generally speaking, impact women more than men, as women traditionally move towards jobs that compensate them in ways other than wages. 
Uh, over time, this creates a compounding system where each successive wage is determined on the reduced wage that came before it. Mm -hmm. um, so this really, we, uh, as we see, is a no-brainer. Uh, a lot of uh, employers have already started doing this, and making this you know, a state law would expand that to the rest of the economy. Uh, so we really see this as an effective way to uh, uh, address um, uh, gender and race uh, inequality in pay. Thank you. Did any of your members have any problems with the bill as far as you can tell? Um, you know, the one thing that came up is uh, one other uh, uh, employment attorney had mentioned that uh, the only benefit that he sees sometimes for his clients is that uh, larger corporations that have um, competitors in the region as well will sometimes use the salary history question as a way to find out what their competitors are paying for uh, equivalent positions. Um, but no one felt that that was that you know that benefit had any you know outweighed the the negative consequences of this practice. Uh, so that was the single moment that you know uh, th an employer found a way to have this benefit them. Uh, everyone else was like you know and even that employment attorney was like that was that's a slim you know right. benefit for uh, a, some very negative consequences. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, committee. So, uh, Emily, so do you, uh, we discussed this and made a few tweaks to it and asked Amy to uh, do an amendment, which I can't find right now. Neither can I. Uh, but I think he dropped I it might. off on the Yes. Do you have a copy of the amendment that, that he worked? No, I'm sorry. Okay, well, come up and tell us what you've been working on with the plumbers. So then we'll switch back when Damien comes. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes, two different switched, bills. I switched yeah. to that bill. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, How would you yes, like? why don't we do that? Let's okay. Two three. Plumbers, and we're not talking OPR. We we're not talking OPR. Okay, so we're moving. I've got to move I'm my sorry, head. Yes, sorry. We're going from 294 to 333. We're working around our witnesses. Yes, yeah. everybody's got quorum issues and needs to be two yeah. places at once. And so okay. I'll, I'll pass out, and um, this is, it's not sort of a traditional finished amendment because we were figuring out um, just before we came in here what, what might want to be in it. Um, so it's like, got some notes on there, but um, I'll walk you through, sort of explain um, what it all refers to. Um, maybe I'll start out with the most um, significant thing, which is, and I think I briefly mentioned this last time I was in here, that um, after the House passed, this bill, it came to their attention that there's an issue wherein um, Vermont has adopted the International Plumbing Code, right. and that assigns or requires certain numbers of toilets um, and sinks and urinals based on gender, and requires separate bathrooms and requires that they be labeled for men and women. And so a, a workaround for that was requested. And right. so an opt out or something we talked about. Mm -hmm. And so that you'll see on page two um, of your of page your two sheet. of what I just handed out. Yes, um, the proposal would be um, to add a new section, um, 1793, which is, starts on line four of of page two of what I handed out. And that in A, um, it explains that notwithstanding what's in any plumbing code Vermont has adopted. Um, a toilet facility can be designated uh, for peer persons of any gender. Um, so it's saying, you know, even though the plumbing code might make it look like you have to make it for men or women, you're allowed to designate it for persons of any gender. Um, that no separate male and female facilities are required if the total number of required toilets in the building under the plumbing code is made up of ones that are designated for people of any gender. Um, and yeah, so that's the first part, that's in A. And then in B, um, so there's, you get into some second order issues when you do this because let's say you have four bathrooms in a, in a building and um, some of them are single stall bathrooms, they make them gender free, that then can throw off, um, so if, let's say the building requires X number of toilets for women, X number of toilets for men. Now some of the toilets are designated for people of any gender. That throws off the calculation in the plumber's code, saying there need to be you know, three for women, three for men. But now, how do we count these that are for people of any gender? And, so, and also, for example, if you've got 
um, a men's bathroom, what was a men's bathroom, um, and it has a urinal in it, um, does that does that get counted as a toilet for, the, for, for the, the total number of repaired fixtures or not? So you get into these sort of second order issues, which probably we don't want to hash out all the um, details of necessarily in statute. And so two options here that we've come up with, um, and that is to say that when the total number of plumbing fixtures, which is toilets, sinks, urinals, um, uh, Sorry, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I got lost. When the total number of required fixtures is fixed separately for men and women in whatever plumbing code we've adopted, as it currently is, um, there's two options. Option one would just be ask the plumbers examining board to make rules um, governing, governing how we're going to count those facilities for people of any gender towards those totals. Option two would be to give a little bit more guidance and sort of set out the principle that the fixtures um, designated for use of, by, by people of any gender will contribute to the required totals sort of in proportion to, so if it's two thirds for women, two, in some kinds of buildings, for example, there are more facilities required for women than for men under the plumbing code. We wish more facilities. <laughs> so, um, so this would be saying we're gonna, if there's a certain number of single cell bathrooms, we're gonna count them proportionally you know, if it's two thirds to right. women, two thirds to men, or one third to men, then we'll count them proportionally to those. Those. So let me just ask you a question yeah. before we. I'm sort of willing to dive deeper. Yeah. That part Thank into you. these fixtures, but uh, the. Um, so what's happening here is we're about to pass a law that was in good shape, ready to go, and now the feds have come up with some requirements that the state. Have, has adopted, but didn't have to adopt. We're not in a preemption thing. We can do more than the feds. We can do slightly it's, different. It's not actually the feds. It's, it's international. It's just that okay, we, we yeah. adopt. A, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and this has come since the House has passed. Exactly. The bill. They became aware of it. Okay. It was they were, these rules had already been adopted. They just no one had realized it was a, a sort of a potential problem. Is one alternative to take our bill and just say that the plumbing board shall change the rules to accommodate the statute? Yeah, and I think that's I what's suppose. intended in well, option one. It seems yeah. like you're going deeper into the, into the detail. That may just be how I'm trying to explain it. Um, that in, in option two, it does give a little bit more saying, we want you to do it proportionally. In option one, it's just saying you should make rules. It says um, the plumber's examining board shall make rules to govern how plumbing fixtures and toilet facilities um, shall contribute to the, the total numbers. And I guess, as you say, you could pull yeah. back even further and just say you'll make rules to... Or, or could yeah. you say at the end of option one, consistent with this act? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make clear that... Consistent okay, so with the intent or with... Yeah. Or consistent with the section. Mm -hmm. Does that do it? Sort of, um, just do that. I think so. I mean, I'm going to defer to my my legal counsel here, but I think we are in agreement. All the people who are really committed to getting this bill through, we want it to be as uh, simple a fix as we can. We don't want it to get bogged down in, in a lot of details. It's it's not a huge um, simple bill. It's it, yes, and so we want to make sure that we keep it as simple as possible, but acknowledge the fact that there does need to be some rulemaking that's done around this. So that would be my preference. Yeah, yeah and I think that the, the only concern is just yeah. that the plumbing board will sort of get what the, the issue is and right. do, it, do it well. well you that's know, why I like the words consistent. Right, the right. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, okay, so if we, did, if we took option one and put uh, consistent with this. I'm sorry. No, this is. Uh, I'm, I'm the director. Yeah, this oh, is or sorry. I'm not actually the director. It's from last year, but I'm yes. in charge of it now. So Becky Wasserman, yes. defer okay. to Emily. Yeah. That's where so, we're. So, um, fabulous. Can you get us a with doing that? Yeah. Can you get us a clean copy and yes. we we'll get back with we'll one Yes. And can I um check? Yeah, we'll see if we need to. Yeah. Okay. So there were a few other um, things, and you may not want to get into them, but I'll just quickly. Um, with this bill. With this bill. Yes. This bill. Yeah. Okay. So, so page one, line 12. Page one, line 12. 
So this is um, so the, the the definition of single user toilet facility in the um, bills as passed is a toilet facility with no more than one water closet and one urinal with a locking mechanism controlled by the user. Um, as we looked back at this, we had a concern that it could be read to mean a room with just a urinal in it, um, because it says no more than one water closet and one urinal. Um, and, and I'm sorry, and this is going to be confusing because this isn't a normal um, um, amendment that I handed you. What I handed you has, an, has our, our alternative that we proposed. If, if you want to look at the, the current um, definition that's in the, the bill as passed, the single user toilet facility means a toilet facility with no more than one. That one? Yes, with no more than one water closet and one page. Yeah. So what you're trying to do avoid is uh, if it just has a urinal uh, and not a water closet. Right. Then that's then <coughs> could that be a single occupancy right. bathroom that gets yep. to. So that was um, the main concern there, and so the proposed one in, in what I handed out um, is taking language from. Uh, 2011 Act 40, which is where we um, required single occupancy restrooms in um, buildings owned by the state to do this, to become um, right. gender free. And so we sort of borrowed from that language in this proposed change definition. Um, and, and so that's, that's sort How of How did we not become aware of the international plumber's requirements then? We did this like four years ago. Jason Lorber, this was Jason's big issue. Okay. Did you have an issue? Yeah, sorry. I was going to say I like alternative three better because um, the one above it that was in the house past version has this weird thing where it sounds like you're saying one more and with a locking mechanism. Right. And so this one seems simpler, easier, cleaner to me. Let's hope it's clear. <laughs> I'm, having trouble, I'm having trouble understanding what the effect is. How am I changing it? With, I'm so sorry, what the effect, effect is, is by it, changing it. Is there any change in, in how the law will work? So it would um, just clarify that when we say single user toilet facility, um, we're not talking about like a, just a room with a urinal in it. And we're also, it also would clarify that we're not talking about a single toilet stall, because you could also read that original definition. It says a toilet facility with a locking mechanism controlled by the user. Um, could read that to mean just a toilet stall. Um, and so this is just attempting to make, it, the idea is you wouldn't, or I wouldn't want to go to a toilet marked, gen, you know, gender free toilet and find only a urinal in there. Um, uh, yes, it would be disconcerting. Yeah. <laughs> and smelly. Okay. So we go with alternative three. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I love the fact that we're using water closet water. <laughs> Perfect. And is the word blue in here? Well, <laughs> water closet is a little bit. No, that may be a suggested amendment by somebody. <laughs> And then I'll, very quickly, there's just a few sort of little um, con, sort of conforming things that as we were looking through the code some more, uh, we saw potential conflicts. So there's a, there would be an addition on, on line 16 of page one, there's a suggested addition of saying notwithstanding any other provision of law, just because as we were looking through the code, we found some other places that gave, for example, municipalities the right to regulate um, bathrooms in some situations. So we just oh, want to really? say. Oh. No, this is trumping all that. Right. Um, and then on um, line three of page two, um, where it talks about the, giving the Commissioner of Public Safety the right to inspect for compliance, um, in the House Pass version, it just references 2731B, which is um, basically the fire, fire safety inspections. Um, and so we were proposing to include the, the, the statutes which talk about plumbing inspections. Okay. And we already talked about the rest of page two. Um, on, on page three in um, line 14, um, where it, it, this is where the plumbing board is given the power to adopt those rules, which is what they did when they adopted the plumbing code. And so this is just um, 
to clarify um, that to the extent a rule of the board conflicts with this subsection, and you were just add or with 40, uh, uh, chapter 40 of Title 18, which is this new rule um, uh, requiring the single occupancy bathrooms to be gender free. So just adding that in there. So it's also suspended. Yeah. The yeah. yeah. Then on page four, um, which is where it gives municipalities the power to, to do these inspections in some cases. Um, and it gives municipalities, the part we were concerned about is it gives municipalities the right to set standards which can exceed state standards. Um, and it, it just wasn't clear to us what exceed would mean in this context. Um, and so it just would clarify that municipal standards won't prohibit this rule as well. I don't think it's necessary to find the there. And then finally, I didn't know if you wanted to um, change the effective date, which is in the House passed version, July 1st, 2017. Okay. Is there any reason not to? No. Just start no, no, no. We could say immediately <coughs> passage. So just date that to 2018. Yeah. Oh, that, oh, you yeah. want to go to 18? I'm saying, do you want to? Is there any reason not to go effective upon passage? Yeah. Is there any lead time with this um, for people to start? Thinking about a plan that I mean, I think it will we'll get less signage. push back on the floor if we just give some lead time. Okay. I really yeah. don't want yeah. it. Yeah, okay. But they can have plans in place to do it. Okay. Plus, it's amazing how many bathrooms I've started to notice, of course. Yes. Ever, actually, ever since Jason's built, because I noticed it in state buildings, but man, a ton of places are really rolling out. Yes. Every bathroom gender I used yesterday when I was at Harvard is gender free, gender neutral. Good. It's great. That was a good copy yep. this morning. And we were, uh, Emily, thank you. I really you. appreciate it. Uh, so, and Damien, we Damien. started with Dan. Oh. Okay. And then, because, because Emily wasn't ready, we've been doing this dance, but I think we'd love to hear from. Damien, I seem to recall. And also, uh, I think Carrie. We had some suggestion changes. Carrie's on 77. Yes. Not on and we, can, we can't She's follow any. I have brought copies. Oh, no, I. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I brought copies and. Okay, and walk us through it. Okay. Thank you. Here, I'll go. Don't mind. <clears throat> All right. Hello. 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 How are you? Hell. Good morning, Governor. Could we just have an update of CT updates later this morning? Oh, I have a moment. Because you would have language, I think, at some point. We finished the CTE language. And we asked Jim, yes. Jim Demeray to pass it to Davis Hall. Too, so. Oh, okay. So, Mr. Chair, um, we finished our work on the CTE language. Great, thank you. Jim Demeray was told to pass it to David Hall, so I think he's putting it in the draft. There's some CTE draft. people here today with the regional economic development people who are here. And if I could so we're, we're show that to them. That would yeah. be great. Uh, we yep. have, we have time. We'll you saw their letter, the CTE director crowd, that a bunch of people had been in touch. Yeah. And Eileen, obviously. So. And I think we, we took a lot of Eileen's suggestions, although, although not the one that she was most adamant about. Thank so. you. Uh, okay, then. Good. So, so we're getting from here. Okay. So. <clears throat> Right, and you should have uh, draft 1.1, yes, dated 328, 18, and 2.36 p.m., uh, which is the amendment draft. Right. Um, so let me walk you through the amendment. Now, if you'll remember, the House bill had uh, four things that an employer should not do, and one of the things that we discussed doing was condensing it to three and uh, clarifying that language. So the new language provides that an employer shall not inquire about or seek information regarding a prospective employee's current or past compensation from either the prospective employee or a current or former employer of the prospective employee. Whew, I ran out of breath there. Uh, the second one is require that a prospective employee's current or past compensation satisfy minimum or maximum criteria. And the third is determine whether to interview or make an offer of employment to a prospective employee based on the employee's current or past compensation. So um, 
there are those three there. Uh, the next section here we've renumbered to say notwithstanding subdivision A1. Uh, and then we've clarified this language a bit here. So now it provides that if a prospective employee has voluntarily disclosed information about his or her current or past compensation, an employer may, after making an offer of employment with compensation to the prospective employee, seek to confirm or request that the prospective employee confirm that information. And that marries up the section from the bill as passed the House with S-275. Right. Um, kind of combining aspects of both of them. Oh, and then the next section here uh, remains uh, unchanged from the House. Uh, nothing in the section shall prevent, be construed to prevent an employer from inquiring about a prospective employee's salary expectations or requirements, uh, or providing information about wages, benefits, compensation, or salary. And then the last piece here that we added in was a definition of what uh, compensation is, um, because we use the word compensation alone above, and so compensation includes wages, salary, bonuses, benefits, fringe benefits, and equity-based compensation, meaning something like a stock option. So I'm a little concerned about C on line three, because um, if an employer inquires about, with a prospective employee, about what their salary expectations are, uh -huh. they may not be an employee with all the confidence in the world and may sort of be basing their, you know, their notion of, on what they had been being paid. It's a, it's sadly a way that what they had been being paid may continue to inform what they asked for. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right, um, but that's... And then that, you know, that might limit them. I mean, they might be surprised but that, that the job they're looking for is actually, in a, you know, let's say five or $10,000 more than they might have expected. And, and therefore, by inquiring about a, a, an employee's salary expectation, that may be for non-courageous, non-self-esteem people may be stuck in where they, what they were learning. Right, but I think what uh, we're getting at here is that, you know, this is a question where it, it puts the ball in the respective employee's court to say, this is what I'd like to make. This is but, what, uh, this is what my requirements are. And it takes it away from saying, you know, tell me what you're currently making, where they have no control over that I, conversation. So it does give them agency there. Yeah, I, I get that. Um, I get that. I also get that when you're inquiring about someone's expectations, that th those may not um, be as bold. I mean, they may be mired in their salary history. So I mean, can I jump in? Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, we can't get into individual negotiations on a job. We're, we're oh, getting too much into detail here. If we're stopping them from going to uh, or inquiring about previous salary and what they... So when it comes down to it, now what are you looking to make? A lot of businesses already do put salary ranges. That's true. Okay, That's true. so uh, it's, up, it's up to the prospective employee to say, this is what I'm looking for. Uh, I agree. I also would say that this is one of the insidious ways that we continue to perpetuate salary inequity. I'm just flagging it as a, because of, you know, not all women are going to be, anyway, I just am flagging it as a concern. So, um, I agree with Damien. I, I think this shifts the balance so that I don't think we can prevent any conversation about salary because... That's, yeah, no, what, I, I, that's what's at issue. Right. Just give you an example from uh, UVM. So I've been on hiring committees. And the way it works in academic hiring is there's one conference a year where you interview people. And then following that, everybody makes their offers to those people. So 
after you pick your list of the top three people for the post, you call up the first one and you make it an offer. <coughs> the clock is running at that point. Other people are are hiring your best candidates away, and you're not going to have another chance for another year. So, in that interview, one of the things that you say is, "How much do you need to make?" If they say twice what is the maximum we can offer, we know that's important for us to know because if we make them one of our top three candidates, let's say our first one, they may take three weeks to decide on the offer, even though it's, they can't take it because it's not going to pay them near what they need to make. So we should eliminate them based on they need twice what we can pay. And if we're not allowed to ask that, we're disadvantaged with every other candidate time-wise. So I would just say that I think this is absolutely right. You should be able to ask what do you make now, but you need to be able to mask what, what, what do you, you expect to make going forward. Yeah. I'm just saying I, uh, it's a flag concern. I, I have a question on line 16. Mm -hmm. um, on which page? On page one. Oh, 16 is the senator, so that's OK. Um, I, I think the committee got to this point. Uh, as this language, but now I'm questioning. So if in the course of the conversation, the employee voluntarily offers past history, how and is it wise at that point to say to the employer uh, that you have to somehow shut that information out from your mind as to whether you interview or offer this person a job? Right, I mean, it goes to Senator Brewer's point in a way that if you, if they, if they voluntarily uh, contribute to the conversation, that they're going to need, you know, hundred thousand dollars more than what's being offered. Like, of course, you're going to take that into account. Like, we can't offer you the job. We don't have that money. Right. You know, or, I'm, so or I'm going to, I'll offer you the job, but, or, or I'll interview you, but I'm feeling really bad because you're going to be really disappointed. You know, even though you say you want the job, you're going to be disappointed if I know that right. you worked at $100,000 more. At the, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how that's enforced and whether it's a valuable addition. Yeah, I, I'm, I think that's going to be really hard to enforce. So um, just... If there's some information I mean, from how the House dealt with this issue. Anyway. So the, the House dealt with this issue. Um, to, I don't so the House is basically their, uh, their number one is screen a prospective employee based on his or her wages, benefits, compensation, or salary history, um, or request to require as a condition of being considered for an offer of employment that you disclose that salary history, which is a this. Um, I would say that this is a uh, policy decision for the committee here, um, whether you think this is a wise direction to go in. With Senator Baruth's example, one difference that I would point out is that in that case, he asked for what their salary requirements are. Um, now, the, the potential sticking point I could see is if someone said, well, I make 150000 now, and the cost of living is higher here, so I need to make at least 165000 But that goes to that part on the back where if they voluntarily disclose. Right, you can seek to well, if confirm yeah, right. after you make an offer with compensation. I don't think the legislation can protect every individual from themselves. Like, some people are just not good negotiators. They're, they're going to inadvertently submarine themselves in ways that are legal, uh, and and in a sense, that's what an interview is designed to do: is figure out who you are, what your capabilities are, and one of those is how well you can sell yourself in an interview. So I I, I like the way this is yeah. set up. And I agree with you. And conversely, if you're a good negotiator and you're confident, right, then I'm making a hundred thousand dollars currently. So I would love to go to work for your company. I need to make 125, and let me tell you how we can get there. And that would be one approach to be legal, 
Right. But this is all men. You know, when, I, I would say, I, 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 I'd respond by saying, I, I actually, one of the problems here is that women aren't always this confident. Women aren't always as uh, self-promoting as men are. Sorry, guys, but you tend to be more self-promoting and self-confident. And uh, one of the challenges here, which is what raises my concerns about the other thing on the second page, is um, is exactly that. I mean, I, you know, women are not in uh, until women are in equal negotiating positions. Which is another issue, I know, but, but Allison, would that's you say, an issue. Would you say then that to compensate for that situation, we forbid all discussion of money? I, I think no, that would be difficult no. to. I no, I, I I'm just I'm, I'm saying I think you know you guys say well if you're a good negotiator you could do this well yeah, or you but don't a lot of women to. aren't. No, that's so, one. That's yeah. one approach. Yeah. That's one approach. He, he went with one, uh, and yeah. I went to the other one. Yeah. But it's voluntary. You don't have to discuss your your salary history. Right. Uh, right. I think the, I don't want to lose the forest for the trees here. Yeah. The most important thing is we don't want employers right. to make you disclose right. what it was that you earned. That's the primary. That is the primary, the primary thing. purpose. I, the and, and that's an important, important one, and it would be a huge step forward. And so I don't disagree yeah. with you, Allison. You're bringing up parts of this conversation that are very important to me personally. You know, seeing how negotiations often play out with differently with men and women, I get that. I just want to make sure we right. don't lose an opportunity here to make a giant step forward yeah. in limiting the kind of discussions that can happen. We can't plan for every eventuality. I agree. I just yeah. had to bring that up given that exchange. exchange. Uh, if I may, back to Senator Sorokin's point on that. So this is, it is a somewhat different issue. And it may be that the committee here wants to consider, instead of saying determine whether to interview or make an offer of employment to a prospective employee based on their current or past compensation, just say determine whether to interview a prospective employee based on their current or past compensation. Given that, during the negotiation process, someone may say, you know, I I don't know, I have to make 150,000 because I make 145 now. Um, but that is a policy decision that that you'll want to consider. But this is, I mean, just to go back to the, the Senator's point, which is away from, mm -hmm. can you discuss what are my requirements? And I think what Senator Baruth highlighted there is the possibility that in discussing the requirements, you may also include a disclosure of your current salary, and then the employer may say, well, I can't satisfy their requirements, mm -hmm. but now they're stuck in a position where, was it because of the disclosure of the prior salary, or was it because of um, I, I like no, your, that they can't make the requirements. I think your suggested change there is in accord with the other pieces of the bill because otherwise the bill is saying you can voluntarily disclose. If if we're saying you can voluntarily disclose, then we shouldn't say right. that that can't be part of the decision. Um, so I would go with okay. Damien's suggestion to change three. Just an interview. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I would, the example I was giving, to, to make it real, let's assume you're a state employee and your salary, your past salary is posted and everybody knows. It's not a question of disclosure. You just you're know, level three or right, whatever. You're, and you're applying for a job that is a much higher level job. Um, in that case, uh, oh, let's say you apply for a lower paid job, but you want it, okay? In that case, we're really not protecting the basic goal here, but right. unless the person gets into the office to explain why, yeah. they may lose that opportunity to get that job. Whereas the, yeah. the next step in the employer's mind, he has this information, not in violation, he or her has this, not in violation of this law, they just happen to have the information. In right. their mind, you know, the person may convince them in an interview, but if they don't convince them in an interview, they may feel, this is such a drop in pay right. for this person. I don't want to have, keep, keep thinking of that, and that's their right to say that. So 
So I agree that would be a good compromise. Just leave it to the interview. And, you know, I, don't, I still don't know how you're going to enforce it, but um, I don't see any harm in saying that. So what's the proposal at the moment to get rid of to interview? Yeah. No, 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 no. make an offer of employment. So to re determine whether to interview a prospective employee based on the prospective employee's current or past compensation. Sort of like ban the box in some ways. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, any other changes? If that's the only one, I can have an updated draft. Oh yes. my God, we might be able to vote it out. Clean for the committee. Oh, crap. Um, uh, I, right. I like to vote what it's fresh. We can fresh. vote 10 out and we still have 10 out of 10. We're fresh until 12. Okay. All, okay. In, all in favor of, I'll move 294 with that change. Oh. All in favor? Just going to do a uh, okay. show me. Yeah, we'll, we'll make that change. Is that this one? It's 294. Yes. Yes. It'll be draft 1.2. It'll be draft 1.2. Thank you. Yeah. I got two votes. Oh. I got four votes. I got five votes. Okay, as, as the sponsors of the Senate version of this, we're thrilled. Senator Allen, do you report this? I would be delighted. Okay. All right. Well, what is it? What are they calling it? Age? Where's that? No dancing. No, no dancing. No dancing. No dancing. No dancing. Uh, I said, I can't dance, but I'm like, Abe, hey, come in. Excuse me. Okay, so the final agenda, we'll move on to the next bill, which I think is. Sexual harassment, correct? Yes, seven. yes, yes. And so um, I know Lisa Senecal is coming. Obviously, she is not in the room yet. So I don't know if we want to start with the folks who are in the room. 707. Uh, <coughs> right, probably in your thing. You know, must be my motion. Damien, you're working so hard right now. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll be right back. Yep. Okay, 707, you said 707. Tom Baldwin Cow. It's probably in your drawer. Is Tom here? Tom's not here. Carrie's here. Damien's coming back. Is Carrie in the place to start? Um, I can start. Sure. It's not asking Becca. Yes, yes, I would love Carrie to start. We need to just. 707. 707. 707. 707. I'd love to yeah, be able to co-report. Also one. 294 with you. As the sponsor of 274. Thank you. I'll be a shadow back. Maybe I could do the sign language interpretation. No, no. no. I could co-report. No, 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 no. Bad road to go. Yeah. Have you seen the video? I forget what it was, but it was the... How do you know? You don't know how I sign if I sign well. No. Mr. Yes. Chair, is it all right if Terry takes it? The guy that, that yeah. you know, universally yeah. they said he wasn't even close to the just yeah. making stuff up. Yeah. And, and the <clears throat> person who was at the podium was like, just assuming. Oh, yes, it. yes. That and was, it was big. Yes. It was like the <laughs> RNC <laughs> convention or oh, like something like that. Yes, it was the RNC <laughs> convention. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know sign language at all. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, Trump up there speaking. I don't know what the speaker right. was. Well, yeah. that, Thank you so much for coming in. Oh. Thank Long you, Mr. Chair. Right? Long time no see. Oh. Thanks for that uh, that vote you just did on the last one. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, you stood with us when we had our press conference. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that seems like a long time ago, but actually, it was ago. just, yeah. I was wearing the same outfit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how perfect is this? We <laughs> voted out of me on the day. So wearing the same outfit this so, so, speaking about wearing the same outfit. Well, what's the name, buddy? I, got, I, have, I have a story. You have an outfit story? I have an outfit story. Okay. Does it involve your green jacket? Close. All right. Okay. Um, so, I was, after selling best, I was. She won the Curtis Award, so I had to yeah. give a speech. Oh, right. Yes, I, was I was there. It was a terrible, was it was a terrible speech, but it was for 900 people. It that was, was, the, it was, it was packed that year. Yeah, it, it was, was really packed. It was packed in part. And, yeah. uh, they sat me at the head table, yeah. and at the head table was Elizabeth Warren. That's got, right. Oh, that's right. She I got my so picture good. taken with Elizabeth Warren, and she was wearing this red, bland, schmata. Boring. She had a schmata. She had a, she had a really boring outfit on that night. I remember that. And then, it's like a couple of Yes, yeah, we are. Yeah. Like, okay, if you're going to be on this page, you know, like, yeah. translate it roughly into rag. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, a schmata. A tasteful schmata. So, <laughs> so, um, it's better than the English version. Fast forward two years, 
she's on the stage of the Democratic National Convention. Right, this and I, and I started, I write, I, I write to my brother, I said, I have my picture taken with her, I'll send it to you. And I look at the picture, and she's wearing the exact same outfit. And I'm like, no, it's not that she was so again. <laughs> she may have several, it may be a Jeff Goldblum and the fly kind of thing. Oh. <laughs> he had only one suit in his whole closet. <laughs> You passed me your thing. All right. Yeah, okay. Okay. I had a whole different right right right. yeah. 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 I've never seen it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> talk about yeah. the owls. Yeah. 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 The trailer. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Thank you. Forgive me if I. Uh, no, I can relate to him. I thought it was all That's over. Right. It was all over. It was all over, but it came back. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine? Oh, no, thank you. Okay. <laughs> if I weren't talking, I would. All right, so thank you very much for letting me speak. I'm Carrie Brown, I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women, and um, we are, of course, very concerned with the prevalence of sexual harassment in the workplace in Vermont. For us, it's, uh, uh, among other things, an economic equity issue, because we know that there are a lot of women who are leaving jobs or working different jobs or making employment decisions based on conditions uh, related to sexual harassment, which are not necessarily the factors that they would ideally be making their decisions with. Um, so I am not an attorney, so I may or may not be able to get into some of the real nitty gritty about this law, but I know you'll have other witnesses who can do that. What I would like to share with you is a little bit about um, kind of the, what we see at the Vermont Commission on Women and, and how this is impacting Vermont women and some of the thoughts that we have about how this bill might be able to address some of that. So we are, um, as you may know, one of our functions is an information referral service. So we have people call us or email us or get in touch with us when they're looking for help. And um, we also have people go to our website and make use of the resources that we have there. We have a very comprehensive document called Sexual Harassment in the workplace or something like that. Um, and it's pretty old, <clears throat> but so far, it's still current. It's really old, actually. It's like 10 or 12 years old. We're just updating our policies. As you know. Yeah. So and feel free to. Well, and so this is a, it explains what the current law is to people. And it's, it's a wonderful document. And if you pass this bill, it will be out of date. And we'll have to figure out some way to update that. But currently, we have a lot of people referencing that. We have people who will call us and say, I read your I read your materials, I looked at your website, I have this question in follow-up. You know, and so we're hitting a lot of people uh, that we people used to call us and we would have these long conversations with them, not nearly as many do. However, plenty do. And so I have some stories that I can share with you and I have some, some perspective that might be helpful to you on that. So we are um, so we, we're seeing uh, mostly women contact us, but not always. Sometimes men are experiencing this as well and contact us, but um, it's a vast majority of them are women. So in the, the most recent data from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in 2016, there were about 16% of the complainants were men. So it's- um, In what year? That was 2016. We don't know who was harassing them. Um, whether it was women or other men. Um, they also, in that same year, uh, they did a comprehensive study of workplace harassment overall, and they found that when employees were asked if they experienced sexual harassment without defining the term, that about one in four women said, yes, I've experienced that. Um, then when they uh, described more specifically what that would mean and asked again, it was more like 40% of women said, oh, you know, things that they hadn't necessarily thought of as being sexual harassment, things that were like um, unwanted sexual attention or sexual coercion. The, the number jumped a lot. Mm. Uh, as I said, this is an economic security issue for women. If um, a, a, there's about 80% of women who've been harassed end up leaving their jobs within two years. And oftentimes, I mean, we hear all the time from women who when we tell them the remedies that are available to them, 
they say, well, I'm, I don't really want to go through with that. I don't, it's not worth that. I don't want to get the guy in trouble. It wasn't that big a deal. Or everyone's going to know it was me who filed a complaint at work, and I don't have the money for a lawsuit. You know, they have many, many reasons for not kind of pursuing it all. And so for many of them, the option is I'll just find another job. I'll just leave. But unfortunately, um, a, a lot of them end up uh, going to lesser paying jobs or reduced work hours. And so it can have that, that economic impact on them. Women who are harassed are about six and a half times more likely than those who are not to change jobs. That really has a significant effect. And uh, of course, in Vermont, we're, we're concerned about women's ability to support themselves and their families already. And we know that, that uh, um, it's not unique to women, that there are are a large percentage of them having a hard time making ends meet, but um, you know our most recent analysis was about 43% of women working full time in Vermont are not meeting their basic needs, right. as the JFO defined. Um, and uh, as I say, it's not unique, um, but it's worse for women than it is for men. And so that's sort of our, our underlying um, concern about that. And so we we find that this affects women from. All different kinds of industries. So in the in the news with the Me Too movement, we've been hearing a lot about high-profile industries, about high-paying situations, and um, and that certainly is a problem. But it's it's a problem everywhere. And um, you know, uh, the restaurant industry, for instance, is just rife with it. Mm -hmm. And um, oftentimes, women will just kind of accept it as this is just how it is to work here. Oh well, and they just deal with it and um, try not to, to sweat it too much. And when you look at the overall, uh, this is nationally, where the complaints come from, the industries that they come from, about over 50% of them are coming from accommodation and food service, from retail, from healthcare and social assistance. And then um, some of them are also coming from manufacturing, which is what we don't see a lot of women, but it can be a particularly difficult in environment for women oftentimes. And so, can, yes, can I just go ahead. back to, just because, as, as you know, we've dealt with the minimum wage this year, or at least we're begin, we're trying to, and um, still in the house. Um, and we, as you know, in in the course of that, bills were dealt with tipped wage. Um, and tipped wages exacerbates this problem for women in these industries, in exactly the same industries. Not in retail so much, but in accommodation and in restaurants. If we, and you didn't testify to this, but it, it is as I listen more and more to the tip wage challenge as this bill progresses through the building, might you know, might we in the future consider getting rid of tip wage? Some, you know, we we we've talked about it, but you know, this is an ongoing concern. It, it it raises its ugly head again here in this bill. I mean. I just hope that you think about that. It's yeah, it, so that's that's actually a topic that's kind of on our on our radar, but that we haven't really done any research on or, or work. In. And I think it's a I think it's actually a a very broad cultural change that you're talking about yeah. when you want to get rid of tipped in, um, employment. Yep. And um, I'm not asking you to do it tomorrow. Yeah, I'm just asking <laughs> us to think about it because if it's such an exacerbating piece of sexual harassment in these specific industries, we can do something about it. Mm -hmm. So I read an article recently, and maybe you all saw this because it was floating around, um, I don't know where it was from, maybe the New York Times, about a restaurant owner, a woman who talked about how she combated sexual harassment in her restaurant. And it was with servers in particular, and it was um, from customers, so the kind of thing that you're talking about. And they developed sort of a code where the server could say to the manager, whoever was on duty, I've got a, a, a yellow table or um, a red, right. and they had like color coding. And, and they were, you know, the, the lowest level was something like the manager would come over and, and check in or keep an eye out. If it was a higher level, the manager might take over completely. And if it was, you know, a red, they might actually just ask the person to leave. And they didn't have to get into, let me explain to you the details of what happened. Mm -hmm. They just could sort of all agree on what the standards were. And so they were looking out for each other. And I was very encouraged to read something like that as a way to address sexual harassment directly. Where, because I'm just not as confident that getting rid of the tip yeah. aspect would mm -hmm. necessarily serve that same purpose. I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great idea. Yeah. Would be great to broadcast that on your website under the sexual harassment. The ideas okay. for change. You know, you, you too could broadcast that as a, as, yes. a, as a method for change. In fact, we just finished uh, developing a new document that was about bystanders and what to do when you witness sexual harassment. And um, it could definitely include something like that yeah. in there. So. Go for it. I mean, that's All right. a great idea. I'll make a note. <laughs> OK, so I want to tell you a little bit about some of the stories that we've gotten from Vermonters. And um, these are, you know, I'm gonna, I have to kind of make them general because they're, all, they're anonymous and they're, they're confidential. Have you sent this electronic to the kale? Um, no, uh, I don't think that, that I great. have. Um, but yeah, I can, I can come up with a version that I can send. Great. All right, so we've got a couple that are really firsthand experiences. So here's somebody who worked at a security company who was verbally and physically sexual harassed by a coworker. She resigned because the branch manager wasn't doing anything. And then the, the, she took the complaint to corporate, an investigation was done, and she was asked to return to work, but at a different site with lesser pay than before, and um, has decided, you know, uh, gave it up and found different employment at a much lesser pay because um, she felt like she was, uh, she was treated like she was the one who did something wrong, and she was penalized with, with lower pay for pursuing this complaint. Another one comes from someone who works in IT and has been working there for a very long time um, and has had lots of experiences being bullied, being harassed, pulled off projects when she complains, reprimanded for things that male colleagues aren't. She said, she told us that she used to work in construction and she said the environment in IT was much, much worse for a woman than being a woman in construction. And being a woman in construction is a no picnic in many cases. She said that, so she's been doing this for many years and she's older and she's kind of, you know, toughing it out, but she said she's seen many, many young girl women come through and just say this is for the birds and leave. And so she's worried about kind of the future of, of, uh, of the industry. Uh, we've had some calls from um, men as well as women. So um, a man who works in a grocery store and there's somebody in management who um, has been sleeping with many of the female co-workers, bragging about it, speaking disrespectfully about them to other co-workers at work. He doesn't know what to do about it. Um, he's gone to HR at his company and nothing has happened. Um, uh, somebody else who was with his girlfriend in a car dealership and witnessed employees making numerous inappropriate remarks and gestures towards her of a sexual nature and filed this, they filed a report with the um, Vermont Attorney General. So, and we have no way to, with all of these, all, almost 100% of the time when people call us, we have no way of following up because they don't tell us who they are and they don't leave contact information. So we just have to sort of hope for the best. Um, so this is a story about someone who had some difficulty with the procedures that your, were- Sorry, your place. caller ID will tell you who called. Not always. Um, on your phone. They do. It, it often it does. It often does. But it's, Sometimes it says unknown. We don't. I mean, we, yeah, right. we will ask people if they want to share their contact information with us, but we don't record that. And we don't. Um, but it is. It's confidential. I mean, people need to be able to call us in confidence. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> so this is someone who works at a, um, a produce market and um, she had a, a co-worker ask her fiance for pictures of her breasts. Um, Did she say fiance? Yep. <laughs> Went to her boyfriend and said, can you give me pictures of your girlfriend, please? Who also worked there. Um, uh, you know, actually, I'm not going to read some of the what next things that are showing up in here because it's impossibly <laughs> not really. But, um, uh, made some really graphic, really overt sexual comments to her in front of other employees um, on multiple occasions. And um, she went to the, the uh, manager um, who said, I don't believe you, and asked her to leave. And she, um, she's called the Department of Labor, Unemployment, the AG's office, didn't really know where to go. Um, so this is... Um, and then when she called the AG's office, there's a, there's a standard practice that, a uh, procedure you can follow to report a complaint like this, and it involves um, 
a very, very long form that's used, if I understand it correctly, and someone from the AG's office could speak more specifically to this, um, covers a variety of kinds of discrimination complaints, employment discrimination complaints that you might experience. And it, and it takes a while to get to sexual harassment in this long form. And this is an example of somebody who just felt completely overwhelmed and couldn't really um, manage it. Along. Yeah, and so our staff uh, kind of talked her through it and helped her fill that out and um, you know just kind of facilitated that. And that's the kind of thing that we have a ton of experience doing. We also have, we don't get calls like this one every single day, so we have time to do this. One of the things that this bill does is it enhances that reporting procedure in a way that I think could be, uh, that we could be able to offer some expertise and counsel about, because we often will get people who just want to, they don't know where to start, and they need to process their experience for a little bit, and, and we have the, the time and the expertise to talk to them about, are you, you know, what kind of employee are you, what kind of um, complaint this might be, and to send them to the right place and to help them navigate that. And so if the, if the AG's office, whoever is doing this enhanced reporting, had additional resources to be able to offer that kind of support, it could make a tremendous difference. Uh, it could really be the difference for a lot of people between filing a complaint and not filing a complaint. So that's one of the things that um, I'm really pleased about in this bill. Um, we've also gotten calls from people who are just kind of looking for information, a new business that wants to know what are the laws, how can I get up to speed. Um, we can send them all kinds of resources for that. And um, so we have, we're able to provide support in a lot of different, a lot of different ways. And one of the things that this bill includes is an education and outreach piece that's assigned to us. Oh, right. And this is something that, again, we have a lot of experience doing. We feel very comfortable being able to do a version of this in collaboration with other state agencies, which, again, we have many, many examples of. Um, publications that we've done and campaigns that we've done. We're working right now on a public education campaign around the law providing reasonable accommodations for pregnant employees. We're working with the Department of Health, the Attorney General's Office, the Human Rights Commission to um, do a kind of a, a joint campaign on that. So I, I, and the ACCD. Uh, we're not working with them on that, that particular actually, one. Given that yeah. it's a workplace issue, it should be with DOL and ACCD. Yeah, DOL. We've, we've been we've talked to yeah, DOL. But ACCD well, yes. yeah, but ACCD is a piece of this too. Okay. I mean, I'll, every I'll, training program ought to. I mean, you know, they have such impact on our workplace big time, just like yeah. DOL. Yep, absolutely. Um, I will say that we have um, absolutely no budget whatsoever for. Um, any kind of materials, or I mean, uh, right? We wanted to have you know develop videos, or develop new publications, or even just provide electronic files for people. We we literally don't have any budget for that. Our budget has been cut to where we're pretty Which much we budget? have personnel and we have um, allocated expenses, and that's about it. Yeah, and your budget is now what roughly three seventy yeah. something yeah, like low. that. Um, on the lowest in state government. Yeah, the House put $8,000 into our budget for per diem compensation for for the for commissioners, commission. which has never been there before. But um, So in the original that, bill, did they have a, a dollar amount for education? And no, education? no. And, and, I, and I, don't, I don't say that in order to, to tell you you can't pass this without sending you to appropriations and getting us more money. I don't mean that at all. I just kind of want to put appropriate expectations on what we're able to do. We can do a lot without spending money on paper things, you know, or hiring consultants or anything like that. We could do a, a much better job with more money like anything else, but we can, right. we can, do, we can do this with our existing do budget. Do you have a notion system. of what it would cost? Oh, well, um, if we wanted to do, you know, videos and, and travel around the state and things like that, I, 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 we could spend all the money that was given to us on that. Um, but we can do things uh, online, and we can do collaborative work with other state agencies and with employer groups uh, yeah, without spending any extra money. Yeah. And it's also a threat. It's some, it, it would be interesting if we were willing to consider putting some money in for it to have it matched, um, because my guess is that this is a something that a bunch of our 
business uh, organizations and alliances might be willing to match if the state was willing to put in something. Yeah, I think that's an interesting idea. Um, and there may be, uh, we may be able to, to do a little creative thinking about other sources of, of money to, to do more. Yeah, I'll have to think about that one a little bit. Did you hear that? I did not. Um, I was suggesting that actually if we wanted to put our money where our mouth is, um, we might consider putting some money into this bill to, uh, uh, to finance some of the outreach and education at, with the proviso that um, some of that money, that that money is matched by some of the, or with the encouragement or however we want to do it, that money be, would be matched by the business community either you know the business organizations and alliances that might be willing to match the state's investment. We recognize there's a sexual harassment problem. We need to be part of the solution. You're our arm into working with ACCD and DOL and education, everybody else, the AG's office. But you need tools to do I mean you need financing. And so that's an idea I'd like us to It'll hang it up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's not to say it won't get through, but it'll wait till the end, probably. So that's the Oh, I realize. Yeah. I just want us to think about it. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Um, I think those are the big things that I wanted to address. Is there any questions? So I think, Mr. Chair, since Damian has previously done a walkthrough, I think it makes sense to um, hear from more um, of the witnesses and then bring him in right. and, um, perhaps after the next so, um, here. Actually, I wanted to go to Mrs. Sample, if I could. Okay. And AG's office. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. And I remember my glasses this time, which I did not manage to do in the hat, so this should go much better. Um, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to address the committee. My name is Lisa Senecal. I'm a member of the Vermont Commission on Women. I'm also the co-founder of the Marin Group. We work with women who've experienced workplace sexual harassment and assault, and we also work with businesses to correct cultures and reduce risk um, with the hope of um, preventing and reducing the overall incidence of sexual harassment, which also uh, causes real harm to companies and their reputations and, and value. Most importantly, I am the proud mom of two exceptional young men who are 19 and 17 years old and a native Vermonter. I am also a survivor of workplace-related sexual assault and harassment. The Me Too and Time's Up movements may be new, there's nothing new about sexual harassment. My first experience was unwelcome touching when I was working as a waitress at 15 years old. The next was verbal and physical harassment at my retail job when I was 16. Neither company had a formal HR department. Reporting would have meant accusing the owner's father or reporting directly to the owner who was the harasser. More recently, after holding senior management positions and starting and running my own businesses, I was sexually assaulted by an, an executive after he contrived a meeting um, in an isolated location. As difficult as those experiences have been, they were not at all unique. Sexual harassment happens in businesses throughout Vermont every day. The reality is women mostly, most often silently manage to deflect, avoid, ignore, and endure various forms of sexual harassment from demeaning degrading and sexually explicit comments to unwelcome touching and quid pro quo sexual demands. If the Me Too movement has showed us anything, it's that staggering numbers of women have experienced workplace harassment, yet they never tell even people closest to them. Rare still is reporting harassment to their employers, state entities, or the EEOC. According to a 2016 study that the EEOC did, between four and eight out of every 10 women experience harassment and only two in 10 reported. The opiate, opiate crisis and through a narrowly averted tragedy in Fairhaven, the risk of gun violence in our schools show us that as wonderful as our state is, 
We aren't immune to all the social ills that confront communities throughout the country. Um, I was going to be submitting um, some experience, uh, some um, samples of harassment uh, that has been submitted to the Vermont Commission on Women, but Carrie has done such an effective job, there's no reason for me to do that. Um, well, we'd still love to have your testimony electronically to Kayla. Okay, absolutely. Um, there are three sections of 707 that I would like to draw particular attention to today. The first section is uh, section 1G. Hold on one sec. What? And that is on page, three, yeah. top of page three. Um, an employer shall not require any employee or prospective employee as a condition of employment to sign an agreement or waiver that does not, it does either of the following, and I'm only concerned with subsection B, except as otherwise permitted by state and federal law purports to waive a substantive or procedural right or remedy available to the employee with respect to a claim of sexual harassment. Um, my recollection is that that phrase, um, except as otherwise permitted by state and federal law, was used to address the uh, fact that it is federal statute that allows for mandatory arbitration provisions. I would urge the committee to revisit this section and consider expressly prohibiting mandatory arbitration and sex sexual harassment claims. The Republican-led New York State Senate recently passed by a vote of 56 to 2, a new law related to sexual harassment that among other reforms bans arbitration clauses uh, in those settlements um, that would uh, uh, reads, any employment contract or agreement which has the purpose or effect of concealing the details related to a claim of discrimination, retaliation, or harassment is unenforceable and against public policy. I hope that Vermont can find a comparable way to protect targets of harassment in our state. I, if you may, I don't want to say this for the lawyers, but a couple of questions on that section if we wrote it to say, except as required or preempted by federal law. These would be illegal, but um, I don't know if there is any preemption, and I don't know when it says extent is otherwise permitted by state law, there's some particular provision in state law that carves out some protection for arbitration clauses for I, some good reason. I don't believe that there is um, any provision in state law, and I should leave this to the lawyers since have plenty of them here We've in the room this morning. Good lawyers behind us. <laughs> and Daniel, too. Um, How come you looked away, dude? <laughs> Richard. Uh, I was checking to see Walter C. <laughs> I, uh, my understanding is uh, that very often states will push limits as far as they can oh. um, when the federal government has imposed. Um, federal law that okay. um, is damaging to yeah. citizens of an individual state. So, yeah, no, I, and, and yeah, I appreciate you bringing that section. We'll also hear from our legislative council as to why the House put that in. Right. So. Um, the second area I'd like to address is section 1H. Next one. Then. From the drafting of this legislation, one key goal was to provide whistleblower protection under specific limited circumstances for individuals who have non-disclosure components in their settlement agreements. As this bill is currently written, it does not yet accomplish that goal. Section 1H merely codifies existing law enumerating rights that all people retain even if they sign NDAs. It does not, however, address the critical issue of non-disclosure agreements, either intentionally or unintentionally, serving to hide the actions of serial sexual harassers and assaulters. Women who sign non-disclosure agreements should not be forced to become complicit through their silence. We would consider it against public policy to have employees sign confidentialities related to workplace safety violations. We need to recognize that sexual harassment is a workplace safety issue, resulting in not only physical, emotional, and psychological harm, but very often has a long-term negative impact on future earnings. And mental health. And mental health. According to the EEOC, 80% of women who report sexual harassment leave their jobs within a year. 
The majority take jobs with lower pay, lower status, less responsibility and opportunity for advancement. Very often, women leave the industry they were working in altogether to move to fields that are more heavily female. Unfortunately, female-dominated fields also tend to pay less. When we look at the gender pay gap, we can't ignore the role that sexual harassment plays. It harms women and families and creates a drag on the overall economy. With Vermont's demographic challenges, we cannot afford to have women's careers and incomes derailed due to sexual harassment. Contrary to what you may assume, I am not opposed to NDAs. Although they were originally envisioned to protect trade secrets, they serve an important role um, in sexual harassment settlements. The privacy protections go both ways, and that privacy um, can have a great deal of meaning for survivors. New Jersey, California, Pennsylvania, and Washington State all have proposed legislation that would prohibit, to varying degrees, the use of NDAs in sexual harassment settlements. New York State has passed new laws, sorry, new rules that prohibit mandatory arbitration and prohibit NDAs unless they are at the request of the victim. These protections also extend to independent contractors and freelance workers. I appreciate the goal of what New York State has done. I have a, I have a concern with the method that they have chosen because victims may be pressured into signing NDAs in exchange for a higher settlement amount and um, it, it would not be in the best interest of victims to uh, lowball settlements and only offer legitimate settlements. So uh, I agree with the line you're pursuing. I'm just a little confused. Are, are you suggesting a change to a piece of this, or are you saying that we're lacking a piece? I, I believe we're lacking a piece. I okay. think we need, um, yeah. in this section, there needs to be an additional. And do you have suggested? Yeah, do you yes, have yeah. Okay. Is this the um, issue that Sarah Copeland yeah. has just said yeah. that she would like to see added by yes. Sarah? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Both these things are great. Um, um, so I do urge the committee to amend 707 to render NDAs null and void in circumstances where a survivor learns that their perpetrator is a serial harasser and that history had not been disclosed to them prior to signing their non-disclosure agreement or in instances where victims learn that the perpetrator has continued to harass. Survivors should not be denied the ability to warn others. Victims could still opt not to disclose the existence of other victims. They can choose not to do a thorough investigation and identify other victims, um, but they would be assuming that risk. It would provide a strong incentive for honesty in negotiations and for businesses to take all reasonable measures to ensure the perpetrator does not continue to offend. There seem to be two main arguments that, against this, um, nullifying of NDAs. Um, I find both of them incredibly insulting to women. Uh, the first is that if women aren't under NDAs, they'll share their settlement amounts with fellow co-workers and say, hey, look what I got, and this is all you have to do, and you can get money for your claim, too. Um, and that was actual testimony that was given in House General. Um, this by, creates... By a business? No. By someone else. <laughs> Uh, that paints women, the entire gender, as threats inside a company who conspire with other women to victimize employers and make a fast buck, or in this case, I should say, a fast 85 cents due to the gender pay gap. False allegations are not the problem. Underreporting is. I encourage you to ask anyone asserting that false reporting is a significant issue to cite cases or studies that document this problem. Fortunately, we have had an unintended but excellent decades-long test running in the state of Vermont. Um, the state as a public employer does not have non-disclosure agreements as components of their settlements. Despite this, the state does not have a problem with details of settlements being widely spread or disclosure of sexual harassment settlements amount leading to a rash of baseless complaints being filed. Women aren't eager to talk about sexual harassment. They're not eager to report sexual harassment. 
They're certainly not looking for reasons to talk about it after they've already signed a settlement agreement. I can say from personal experience, there is no pleasure in describing again and again your degradation and victimization. Victims are slut-shamed and have their honesty and motives questioned precisely, precisely as this argument shows. Coming forward carries great risk to jobs, careers, reputation, and the negative blowback in small communities is real. It's highly likely that your harasser um, is someone in the community. Uh, they, are, they are known as one person. Most people don't know that side of them, and it is very difficult for your fellow community members to believe uh, that that could happen. Uh, victims, perpetrators, coworkers, and employers have social circles that all overlap. And you run into everyone at the market, walking down the street, and um, it's not unusual for children uh, to attend the same schools. There are strong forces at play that discourage reporting, not encourage it. The other argument is that companies will be less likely to settle if they can't be guaranteed silence or will pay lower settlement amounts. This is where cultural change comes in. Companies need to see the financial portion of settlements that they are paying is to do right by the person who was harmed and they are not buying silence. That is a minor component of a settlement agreement. In time, with the right encouragement, companies will come to the realization that dealing promptly and appropriately with sexual harassment is a good thing for their company. They can either be NBC and handle things the way that they did with Matt Lauer, um, or they can be Fox, and they can pay huge settlements, um, get one NDA after another, only to have this eventually come out and make them look far worse than they had if, if they had just dealt with it in the first place. The final section that I'd like to address is commonly known as a do not darken my doorstep, or more simply a lifetime ban. Is that in this bill? It is. Yeah. Section 1, subsection H1. Oh. The bill prohibits them, not creates them. Right. <laughs> Um, it reads, an agreement to settle a claim of sexual harassment shall not prohibit, prevent, or otherwise restrict the employee from working for the employer or any parent company subsidiary, division, or affiliate of the employer. Testimony was given in House General, uh, varied from uh, these provisions don't exist in settlements in the state of Vermont, uh, to companies need to be protected from someone who caused significant turmoil inside their company. Um, by bringing forward a harassment claim. Uh, this is the worst kind of victim blaming to, um, to state that uh, it is the person who was harassed and had the courage to come forward who is the problem, who created the turmoil in the company, um, could not possibly be more misappropriately placing the blame. Uh, and this becomes another deterrent against reporting. Uh, these clauses are in um, settlement agreements that the state of Vermont has, and I can tell you personally, they are in private settlement agreements as well. Um, often when I bring this uh, up to people, this issue up, their immediate reaction is Vermont doesn't have any businesses large enough for this to really be an issue. Um, but consider that the state of Vermont is the second largest employer in the state. It also, this provision applies to affiliate subsidiaries and divisions. That means that if a doctor had a harassment claim um, and a settlement with the University of Vermont Medical Center, uh, she would be not only prohibited from working at the medical center again, but be prohibited from the UVM Colleges of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences, the Alice Hyde Memorial Center, Central Vermont Medical Center, Central Vermont Physicians Hospital, Elizabethtown Community Hospital, Porter Medical Center, and the Visiting Nurse Association of Chittenden and Grand Isle Counties. Uh, having a settlement uh, with the Burlington Pre Free Press with this provision in it uh, would prevent the person from working from any of the 81 newspapers and broadcast outlets owned by Gannett. 
and um, at the, the lower end of the income scale, if Marriott uses this provision, a housekeeper could be banned from working at Starwood, Spring Hill Suites, Courtyard Residence Inn, Fairfield Suites, Sheridan, and more than 20 other hotel chains around the world. You get the picture. Businesses are becoming cons more consolidated, not less, and so that is happening so in Vermont. Does this provision apply only to settlement, provisions of settlement agreements, or could an employer say this is such a bad experience for all sides and they put out an email to the rest of the people in state government and say don't go near this person again. And that would be considered retaliation and then okay. we'd have a whole new set of issues okay. to resolve. Okay. Um, H707 is a really good bill with a couple of amendments. It could be a powerful step in shifting the culture not only in Vermont but be a model for the nation. Vermont's long been a leader in protecting and enhancing individual rights. It's a most basic right for all people to be able to pursue careers and opportunities to do their jobs and support themselves and their families in safe environments where they're treated with respect. Creating an environment where all Vermonters go to work to their full potential not only benefits individuals, but it's good for employers, our economy, and our business environment. As we work to expand our economic base, attract and retain talent, and start and expand the businesses that employ them, a key component of the special quality of Vermont provide that the special quality that Vermont provides should be protecting the dignity of our citizens and opportunity for all of them. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. I had a question about the, I, I think it was the, the middle provision you suggested. Um, and that's the, the idea of serial harassment and having that nullify the agreement. Um, and I'm thinking that something that happens in the past uh, might be easier than something that's currently ongoing and has yet to go through any sort of formal process. So let's say you have an, an NDA and uh, a current coworker of the harasser involved alleges harassment. Does the allegation itself nullify the NDA, or would there need to be some process, some finding that would trigger the nullification? The the allegation, um, and you know, this is a risk that employers and uh, people under NDAs uh, would take. Um, there, in most settlement agreements, there is a disincentive to uh, break them without cause, because usually there are clawbacks or liquidated damage clauses or something. So a person under an NDA is going to be very careful about coming forward and accusing their harasser of harassing someone else. But yes, it would be an allegation, because the majority of the time, you would never find out what, at the end of that process, what. Well, now I'm a little confused. Does the, so I'm thinking person A, person B have mm -hmm. an NDA, and then that's enforced for a year, and then person C um, makes an allegation mm -hmm. of harassment. Does that allegation then nullify the other two people's? Yes. So, Lisa, why don't you share, if you're willing to, your own experience with this particular situation, because I think it might help eliminate what we're talking about here. Are you willing to do that? I, I am. Okay. Um, when I was sexually assaulted, it was in the hiring process. I had been going through a series of meetings and interviews that were strung out for about five months um, until one of those meetings was in an isolated location. I was assaulted. I went through the miserable process of coming forward and finally reaching a settlement agreement, which did include an NDA. The, prior to signing that settlement agreement, I made sure that I received assurances that I was the only person that this perpetrator had ever done this to. and that two thorough investigations had been done to identify any other victims who had not yet been identified. And I was told this was done and there was no <coughs> else. I signed the agreement, 
five months later, I got a message on Facebook from a woman I had never met who said, um, she asked if I would be willing to meet with her, understood that I really couldn't speak about my experience because of, of my NDA, but that um, she had been assaulted by the same man. Um, she was absolutely the first person you would have thought of who the company needed to speak with to find out whether or not she had also experienced right. this assault. Right. She was in the hiring process. We are similar age. We look very similar, and it was the same time period. And they did not manage to even ask this person. She had never been contacted by the company. So that's one example of the kind of situation that you can end up in. And yes, that's only an allegation. Well, um, and, and uh, I see that, and that's clearer to me, because it's something that happened in the past, and you're agreement was supposed to have covered that time period. Yes. I'm thinking more of, let's say that they had been active and they had investigated everybody mm -hmm. and and that was actually true that that person had harassed them. Mm -hmm. Then two years goes by mm -hmm. and the person hears of an allegation uh, which remains just an allegation mm -hmm. at that point. As I understand you, you would be saying that that would nullify the agreement from the community. Yeah. It would, the likelihood after two years, that some, most people will have put this well in their past. Um, depending on what the allegation was, if it was a similar circumstance, um, one of the provisions in my um, settlement agreement, or prior to the settlement agreement during negotiations, was that this person was no longer allowed to meet alone uh, with women in the office or off campus uh, for conducting business for that company. Uh, so if, if the circumstances that I learned later were he had locked another woman in an office, then that is, that is a pattern. That's the company not following through on what they said they were going to do to make sure they were mitigating the risk um, to future women. So. So yes, I think women mm -hmm. under those circumstances should be able to speak. Lisa, did um, when the company assured you that there had been no other instance like this, did you get that in writing? I mean, no, was that did not. It is not was that part, part of the agreement. No, it should be part of the future agreement. Yeah, exactly. Because if if that agreement is clearly not true, then you do have a leg for either further suits or right. or stepping outside. So um, you mentioned at the end of your testimony that I'm assuming with these changes it would help put Vermont at the forefront of the country in this area. Can you just, in like 60 seconds, say the areas where we would be before, at the forefront compared to other states? Um, this, this way of handling, um, no other state is trying to find a way right now that they can to have some balance between having NDAs that completely prohibit speaking and completely getting rid of NDAs. Uh, this would allow us to find a middle ground. If companies are operating in good faith, if they have disclosed, if they have cleaned up workplace practices that allow the harassment or assault to occur, they should not have they should not be worried that this same person is going to reoffend. That that problem should have been taken care of right. either by changing job responsibilities and, and access, yeah. training or firing yeah. them. And that's the middle ground for allowing NDAs yes. within that box to continue. Are there any states that have totally prohibited NDAs? Um, New York, New York State has totally prohibited them um, unless a victim requests that there be an NDA. And, but you still think there's room for an NDA as long as I do. There's I, this I provision. Do. When when everyone um, fulfills the obligations uh, of that contract, then yes, an NDA should stay in place. There's so how, does reason. New York, how does New York ban it yet let it in if a victim? 
does it does it have some sort of stricture that says mm -hmm. it has to be initiated initiated by the victim otherwise it's a problem it doesn't specifically say the victim needs to initiate it it just says that the victim has to now it is at the request my concern with that is that counsel for the employer could say to counsel for the victim you know, you know yeah. if you if she asked right, right. for an exactly. NDA right, yeah. right. We'd be able to offer I have to say, I, I find myself more leaning toward just getting rid of NDA because what, what, and I, and I understand the, the logic behind it, but it seems like the non disclosure agreement, as it applies to sexual trafficking, has non disclosure in its title because that's what it's seeking to do. And yet, everything that we're, that we're talking about and trying to put in the language is to is to combat it and produce disclosure, and yet still allow the agreement to be made and sealed with an exchange of things of value between the sides, in other words, payments. And I don't know that those are ultimately, I feel like this is maybe a half step, and then in 10 years we'll say, what were we doing? Why don't we just outlaw NDAs in this instance? Yeah, I, so, think, I think that's entirely possible. Um, it, The benefit at this point of still having that option of NDAs um, for me is that we have not had the cultural change yet right. that we need um, for, this is not just the companies that face exposure, this is the victims. Companies would be free to talk about victims as well as victims talking about what happened. And right now, um, we have not reached a point where victims are not blamed for the harassment or for you know coming forward and causing problems in the community but, or but I, the company. Just to follow up, if I could. So the, the example that I gave before. So we talk a lot in here about contracts. We're working with the brewers and the franchisers, and should we enter into their contractual relations? And so one thing that makes me uncomfortable, and I haven't seen the language. Mm -hmm would be the idea that somebody could sign a contract, accept um, payment, have non-disclosure be the agreement, and then if one person in the future makes an allegation, the allegation would itself nullify that. That, that seems to me um, uh, weakening contract law in a very profound way. So I, I would rather not have NDAs mm -hmm. because that way you don't have that problem. The information is out there from the start. Um, or not. I mean, in or, most cases, people, you reach a settlement agreement, or the victim be, doesn't want to talk it about it, the out. company's not going to talk about it. But I mean, the NDA but it could prohibits, be. but it yes. could be out there. And, and so I feel like in this middle ground, we're being pushed toward a place where the contract would hold tight for one party, but not for the other party, because we so much want to support victims in that situation. Right. But to me, that presses up against contract law in a weird way. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, why not just say in these instances, we're not going to allow contracts to be written that produce that sort of effect, that allow serial harassment. Well, if I, have to, if I have to choose between NDAs that silence women no matter what continues right. to happen and not having NDAs at all, than not having, and it's a no-brainer. But I can see at a point in a, in a, in a person's uh, life where an NDA would be useful. I think in Lisa's case, it's an older person who's clearly got a pattern. I mean, I'm sorry, but if you get <clears throat> actually are effective with an NDA, uh, and it's mutually agreeable for a, a person who's maybe beginning uh, their professional life or younger, it may have a profound impact and actually change, make some of the cultural change we're hoping for. And I guess that leads to my second question. Um, and actually it might have a pr profound impact and change behavior. And, and it wouldn't go on to bug him for the rest of his life. I mean, it would be, uh, you know, uh, sort of like what we do with juvenile court when people, you know, really screw up early on and 
then have a, 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 a moment of seeing the light and actually change behavior. So I, I can see something like that actually being effective um, and uh, making that NDA productive. That being said, we have a huge cultural shift to make in our society. How, and, and Kate, you've heard Carrie, and you're on the commission now, and I applaud you for your membership on the commission, because we're such big fans of the commission. Um, I would just love to know if you had a couple thoughts on cultural change that, you know, where, where would you begin? Um, uh, you know, you and I, you know, I'm the mother of two boys, too. So we are uh, proud parents of people who are going to change this going forward into the 21st century. So we're hoping we've produced four boys that are going to be part we of this hope, We gym. hope so. But we hope so. But, uh, you know, so all of us are individually responsible, obviously, mm -hmm. in parenting. But what would you, I mean, this is a big, this is the biggest challenge that we face is the cultural change, independent of our laws. Mm -hmm. How do we affect? Who want to do a thorough investigation of the organization um, and have a complete understanding of anything and everything that might be going on and then have recommendations and training to be able to cure whatever those issues are. Um, most companies care about their employees and this, these things aren't happening because they want them to. It's mostly ignorance and neglect. Um, so to be able to go in, change some of the corporate cultural practices that are going on, um, can have a tremendous reduction. Um, and one of the things that we insist upon is that the executive team be a part of that process and a part of the trainings. It's not unusual that senior management or executive level folks are not required to participate in sexual harassment trainings. And up to this point, um, trainings have been shown to be incredibly effective in the way that they've been done, so I'm not sure that's really been a big problem, but going forward, now that um, we seem to be taking this a little bit more seriously than we have in the past, um, trainings can be changed, so it's, um, it's less going in and, um, or going online and taking a, you know, reading a pamphlet and taking a test. Um, but it's, it's really getting into those, those difficult, uncomfortable conversations that men and women need to have with each other. So, so those things that people can say and do that the other gender doesn't recognize as being offensive have an opportunity to, to really have a conversation and understand why that is. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We're running kind of behind here. Uh, <laughs> Senator Ballard, who would you like to hear from next? Uh, Damien, I think. Damien? Well, Tom's here and okay. AG's office. Let's, we have Tom Waldman and we have two attorney, two other attorneys here. Heather Wright and Richard Cassidy. Okay. Uh, any choice of those state attorneys? No. Yeah. And Julia. Is it Bankers State? Is that yes. why everybody's here? And the bankers came the economic development. That's yeah. why we have so many people here. Uh, uh, well, let's hear from uh, the people who are bankers. certainly from out of the building. So let's hear from Heather Wright first. Um, I am here. I think I'm about to second everything Rich had to say, and I think he's a probably more persuasive person anyway. Okay. Do you want to go? <laughs> and then from, I, I, I represent employers, so there, I mean, I acknowledge that there's a level of skepticism of everything that comes out of my mouth. Rich is probably about to say everything I'd say, and he represents employees. So I think he's a little more, uh, he's got a better insight into this. So you've already sort of damaged his credibility. <laughs> 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 Well, for those of us who haven't met you yet, you have nothing will, that's been there. Yes, I will introduce myself. And, and let me just say you're talking to one of the foremost experts in the country on arbitration issues. I know more about it than I wish I did. Uh, well, thank you, Heather. I, I was, as uh, you know, I'm Richard Cassidy. Uh, I've long been interested and involved in civil rights law in Vermont. I was appointed to the old Human Rights Commission by Governor Salmon while I was a college student in 1973. I served until I went to law school in 1975, uh, including the two years I served as a judicial law clerk 
I'll have been practicing law in this state in October for 40 years. My practice is focuses on representing individuals, mostly individuals in personal injury cases and employment cases. I also work as a mediator and occasionally as an arbitrator. Uh, since at least 1982, representing employees in employment disputes has been a major focus of my practice. I've represented scores and scores of women and some men who have been victims of sexual harassment. I occasionally represent employers. I occasionally represent employees who've been accused of sexual harassment. I occasionally see, see these cases in my work as a mediator. In, 19, in 1998, I wrote a chapter of a book I see over there on the wall, uh, uh, Vermont State Government since 1965 on the development of civil rights law. Mr. Cassidy, with all due respect, yes. we don't have much time. All right, I, let me get I would to the love point. to get to the bill. Let me get to the uh, point. Pardon me, Mr. Chair. I have, I I have, I have some observations about the bill. Focus on the language. First of all, let me say that we already have the best fair employment practices statute in the country. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, just If just having good law would solve these problems, the problem would have been solved a long time ago. Good warning. I do think there are two things that are very important that we need to emphasize more. Education is very important. If you talk with behavioral scientists, they will tell you that being reminded of the rules is very important and very helpful. Secondly, enforcement is very enforcement, they're very important. And we have a real problem with respect to enforcement. I'm probably one of 10 or 15 lawyers in the whole state who regularly does these cases for employees. Yeah. That bar is getting smaller as we get older. I don't see a lot of new lawyers enter this practice. It's a very difficult practice. These cases are very hard because they are fact sensitive. There are a lot of facts um, because there often are few witnesses and very little corroboration. Uh, the law is already complex. Uh, the employers are well defended uh, and know how to make these cases uh, difficult. It's their job to do that and they do it. Um, I would suggest to you that the bill uh, doesn't really do much to, import, to improve enforcement as it stands. I heard money mentioned earlier. Uh, comparing the resources that the Attorney General's office has today to the resources they had in 1996 when I did the research for that, that essay, they maybe have one more staff person. Uh, at that time, it was taking 420 days to get uh, the average case cleared through by the Attorney General's office. We're doing better, a lot better today. It's 207, approximately 270 days, I believe, but Julio can give you more information about that. That sounds a lot better. But I gotta tell you, it's an outrageously long, difficult time for any of my clients who have to rely on that process. Um, and, and we, I think, if you really want to affect this, more resources is, is really the key. Um, on the government side, I, I think the bill in, 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 it, it, it gives the Attorney General's office more responsibilities that I think they'll have a hard time meeting. Um, I, I heard the testimony of my, the receiving witness about non-disclosure agreements. I think this is a very important pressure point. Nobody wants to see a Harvey Weinstein style sex harasser get away with this over and over again. I don't think it is a very common problem in Vermont. Um, having a sexual harasser on your staff is not good business. And once the cases are resolved, most of these people get fired or eased out of their jobs because smart businesses do not want to have them around. Um, an unfortunate consequence of lengthy litigation about these cases is that if businesses feel forced to circle the wagons and protect the harasser. And so trying to get these cases resolved quickly and through negotiation is very, very important. And where does non-disclosure agreements fit in there? Well, I, I, I don't want to tell you this because I don't like it, but a non-disclosure, the ability to agree to a non-disclosure agreement is one of the most valuable tools in my toolbox for these victims. Yeah. If you know, I got I need to bring these cases to closure. What most of my clients, most of these women want, 
is they want to get out of there and move on someplace else. And if they can get a little help to do that, that's typically what they want. Uh, without sure. that weapon, uh, you know, these negotiations are hard fought, right. bare knuckles negotiations. The employer is not sitting there talking with me about what's good social policy or cultural change. It's rich. If you want this case to settle, here's what I want. Non-disclosure agreements are ubiquitous in these agreements. Yeah. And do not darken my door agreements are ubiquitous as well. If, if those tools go, and, and employers need closure, if I can't give them those things, it's going to reduce the number of cases where I can do something. Because, right. you know, a very common fact pattern is he said, she said, nobody saw it, there's no document, there's no nothing. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm very sympathetic to the view that we need cultural change. We do need cultural change. I ask you not to sacrifice the chambermaid that I represent from the motel uh, who's, been, who's been harassed repeatedly on the altar of cultural change because there are not many people standing by those folks and they need help. And they rely upon a system which either involves turning to the government for help with few resources or turning to the private bar for help. And um, as I say, it's hard to do these cases already. Um, Could I just follow up? Yes. Yes. Could I just follow up on that? So um, I understand that NDAs have their place. Yes. How do you feel about a better balance that, that Lisa has proposed? I don't think the balance that we have is, is well, certainly not ideal because I'd like to see a better world. Right. All right? But uh, I don't think that the balance is that bad because if I'm doing a case, I'm listening to what my client tells me about, what my client's heard. And if we're going to go to court, we're going to do some discovery. And I'm going to find those cases. And the court's not going to, going to enforce that non-disclosure agreement against me in a situation in which I'm going to take your deposition if you were a victim. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to get at that information. At if, the serial issue? Uh, Have uh, you it, got, and I assume you've gotten at a serial of issue. Of course, of course. You know, it does happen. And, and, and so the agreements are void is against public policy if they're going to prevent somebody from cooperating with the government investigation or if they're going to prevent somebody from testifying under a valid subpoena in, in the deposition. Can we specify, can we do something that's being suggested where they're allowable but they become void upon discovery that uh, you say? Well, I think you say that a court, You're saying that a court would find those things unenforceable by law if, you, if they were repeat offenders or against some sort of public policy. I think Senator Ruth puts his finger on the problem with that, which is what's the trigger that, that allows release, you know, and, and if a mere allegation is enough, uh, I don't think that's really going to help. I, I, don't, I don't see an easy what way around. Other, what are other areas of the law that you're aware of where non-disclosure agreements are not permissible? I mean, we passed a law here, I remember, a few years ago. It's very hard to find this law, by the way, but it's there, it's there. Uh, in terms of referring from one school district, referring, yeah. giving a reference to another. Yeah. And they signed, they signed a non-disclosure agreement. We made it against public policy to not allow the first school district to tell right. the it child is. abuse or something that was. I, I, I can't think, think of it. My teacher was rehired. And the same thing happened again at another school. I can't think of another example, Senator. That doesn't mean there's no one. But I do have a couple of other points that. I Sorry, can I just go to your yes. dark in the door? Thing? Yes. Yes. Uh, that bothers me. I mean, it bothers me. Of course we, it does. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, particularly with national, national companies that own tons of businesses around, to ask. That this person, I mean, to make it a stipulation that they cannot work in any of those places is crippling. And I would ask for you to think about what we could do to limit that and not allow a national owner, and you know, a company that owns many, many, many businesses, to to require that. And then the third, just lastly, you talk about putting resources. More resources is key. Okay. So you would encourage us to actually do the battle of resources for education on this bill? You bet. I think I think 
having free, widely available information for small businesses through the government is a very important thing. I really do think that, you know, we're talking about a battle of hearts and minds, really. Yeah. Um, you got to change people's attitudes. Um, and, um, and I do think that being in a situation in which you're in a group and people are talking about these issues um, is very helpful. And that conversation needs to occur on a fairly regular basis. Um, I am concerned about the provision in the bill that says that you have to file these cases with the Attorney General's office or notify the Attorney General's office if you, if you file one of these cases. I'm afraid that you know businesses are, are well represented and wisely represented. Uh, I think a common response to that is going to be to, to see more mandatory arbitration clauses in employment agreements. Um, and, and that results in a situation, if we drive these cases further underground, that results in a situation in which an arbitrator is not obligated to follow the law to decide the case. Right. That's the reality of arbitration. And those arbitration decisions are far more uh, enforceable, far less likely to be set aside on appeal than a judgment from a superior court after a jury verdict. If that's the law. The federal law of preemption around arbitration is very broad and very powerful. If you're in interstate commerce, you can't discriminate against an arbitration clause in your agreement, or it's void. So. And the last thing I have to say really relates to a different issue, and that is to think. But only this issue for a second. All right. So, what is the provision you're talking about? Do you have the bill in front of you? I do have it. Uh, it's the very one of the last sections. The arbitration one. No, no. It's, it's really the provision that requires uh, that, the, that there be registration. Fi the file. Notice to the section attorney general seven. of these cases. Yes. yes. Section, section seven. seven. So it's on page 11 of our bill. Right, so You're like a different draft than I am. Thank you, bankers. Yeah. Bye. Have fun. Can you explain to me how <laughs> uh, giving notice to the attorney general of a complaint by the superior court would drive these Drive there would be more mandatory arbitration. Being accused of sexual harassment is bad business. Yeah. Companies don't want that. Or they, they, uh, aren't they being accused of sexual harassment? Of course. Is a complaint? Of course. The more publicity and attention that they get, the worse it is for the yeah. business, and the more that they will be driven to find a way around that. How? What's the easy way around that? Let's not let the plaintiff go to court. Let's have an agreement that says, if you have a dispute with me or I from your from your employment, it must go to arbitration. Now, if that happens, nobody's going to see that case. Right. Nobody's going to see that case. So what, what yeah. in your mind was the purpose of the notice of the Attorney General? And is that the straw that breaks the cowboy's back if I would, uh, going to arbitration? I certainly wouldn't say it's a straw that breaks the cowboy's back. No, I, I don't think it's, it, it's that. It's, okay. It's a question of what the tendency is. There's, there, there are some good provisions in this bill. Well, well, One thing, you know, but the question was, yeah. what's in your mind? What's the, or others may answer? What's the benefit of notifying the attorney general? Unless the attorney general has more resources which intervene and help us, I don't know. I guess the idea well, you just is just made a plea for resources yeah. here. So I guess the idea that. is that there would be a better data and more information about the cases. Very few of these cases are going to be court anyway. Right. Um, so I don't think you're going to get better data. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure there's a benefit here, okay. really. Okay. Oh, yeah, one more point. The last point I want to make is to encourage you to think about this a little bit more broadly, this problem. Um, the law is set up the way it's set up as an artifact of how we got here. And, and it's often said that the life of the law is history, not logic. So the law against sexual harassment as it stands is an offshoot of some very tough, smart, creative lawyers, mostly women, one of them with Bader Ginsburg, who, who made the point that when a woman, woman is harassed on the job, um, she's discriminated against. So, so that's how we got here. Well, the artifact of that is that in order for that harassment to be actionable, it must reach a very high level. It must be so severe and pervasive, or pervasive, that it affects the terms and conditions of the, the person's employment. 
the effect of that is there's a, a whole low level range of sexual harassment that is legal. Yeah. Why is that the case? You don't have to let that be the case. You could say unwanted sexual advances, unwanted sexual language uh, uh, are, is, is illegal in the workplace in Vermont. And if you, an employer, get a complaint, you have to do the same thing you'd have to do now uh, if, if outright sexual harassment is proven, and that is you've got to take prompt and effective action to stop it. Right. It's a practical, sensible thing that could be done. I'm sure there are a lot of employers who would like it. Um, but um, I, I'm looking at. So I'm, lower the, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg bar. Absolutely. She did great work. Yeah. But it's time to do more. Yeah. It's time to do more. And may I just tag on to your concern do you, about. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do. I have a question. Um, yes, which is one of the reasons it's bad for business is that it's public of and course. done in the public eye. Of course. So, you know, I have to understand the arbitration issue more, but you're absolutely right. The more that's done publicly, sadly for the victims in, in many ways here, but the more that is publicly done publicly for the companies, the, the more pressure they're going to have about, about actually addressing sexual harassment in the workplace, doing the education, doing the trainings, doing all that work. If you think about the nature of these cases, you compare a sex discrimination case garden variety with a sex harassment case. It's, it's, it's the former case on steroids. It's like throwing gasoline on the fire. There will be an explosion when these allegations are made. Um, it's, it's very serious business. And that provides us with some opportunity to quietly negotiate resolutions that work for victims. They're not ideal. But I don't know what I do with this, with with a case that I don't really want to try because it's going to he said she said because I'm tired. that I can't settle because I don't have the tools to work with. I, I'm sorry if I sound rather cynical. Doing this for a long time uh, has made me. No, made I, mean, me I, I think what you're expressing is the obvious tension here. Yeah. there's a lot of tension, so, yes. and I appreciate the effort on the part of the sponsors to try and say we want to see this end. I just, I'm just not convinced that some of the provisions don't have unintended consequences. Well, you know, one of the things that I feel about this is that, this is, all due respect to people in the room, this is not uh, politically, this is somewhat analogous to guns. We have a moment in time here where we can make some yeah. great progress in this area because of all this shenanigans that are happening nationally yeah. and other things that may get stripped apart or attacked might get some birth uh, because of the, the, you know, the whole uh, issue in Washington. I'm so afraid I'm you may put some more language in the book that doesn't mean very much. Okay. Do, would you be willing to send some proposed language to Damien? Sure. Can you get your email address? Sure. Can I be uh, mindful of the time? Yes, what? If I could yeah. just a few minutes. Absolutely, you're on the schedule. Okay. I don't want to hear. The table arguing with each other. So I represent businesses. Um, I'm going to just generally second everything he just said. I think his experience is uh, duly noted. He's got good perspective on both sides. Um, uh, I did want to just a couple quick points um, to double down on what he said at the end, and that um, this bill is made up, in my mind, almost in two categories. We have this whole first half that Sorry, is um, nitpicking NDAs, oh. this, things like this. Most of that is already covered in either federal labor law, okay, uh, federal, you know, Title VII, public policy, contract law, as you pointed out. We're making, so it's a lot of words and a lot of extra law to make a very small little change. Perhaps a change, but not something that's worth like getting super excited about quite yet. I think the oomph of this bill is the second half. I think it's where, um, the, where the good is done. So where's the most bang for your buck? It's looking at why don't people report? What can we do to facilitate that reporting so that it gets to employer speed so that they have to do something about it? We can't do things about complaints we don't know about. Force us to do something about them by, in, by making it easier for people to come forward and complain. Um, I think the laws that already exist 
create enough framework to allow for, um, once that complaint is brought forward, for the responsible handling of it, there is sufficient framework there. We just need the complaint to come forward. So help us facilitate that complaint coming forward. Um, I will also notice, uh, we, we mentioned the piece about the AG's office providing notice of a complaint to the AG's office. Um, I am concerned, generally speaking, about um, uh, just from a business, it's going to be the standard business argument. Any additional authority by the AG's office to just walk in sort of unannounced. Um, I will acknowledge that they do have this authority when a complaint is at their feet to issue a request for information of these documents while having to actually come in. We just give it to them. Um, so they but do. You just said the complaint has to be made. Correct. So Help us make the complaint. Yeah, when the complaint is on the table already, these are people that did come forward that did say, I do have a concern, please look at it. Um, I will notice, um, Rich sort of tosses this in here, and I, it is an issue I've wondered about. Um, the standard of sexual harassment, I like that it is generally consistent across the country. It helps us to kind of uh, understand where the boundaries lie. Um, I will acknowledge this is an employment bill, so the, the bad actor here frequently falls on the employer, regardless of what the individual did. Um, how do we change this? How do we shift culture? Can you make it criminal? If you don't have to go through the employer, but I can directly go after you as a person, you have a lot more leeway than saying, because right now you have to go through your employer and count on your employer to handle this. You, like, the sexual assault that came, God forbid, earlier, that's a, that should be a criminal matter. This has nothing to do with NDAs. I don't know, I don't know the details of this case. And, it is a, what? I, I, mean, that's, like, I, I don't know anyone, anything about this woman's past. It sounds terrible and tragic. But like this should go beyond the standard NDA. This isn't about an employer taking action or not taking action, which is also important. But like there should be jail time involved with that. Um, and uh, the darken my door clauses. You asked about um, national. Uh, yeah, and like what kind of language should we do with yeah. this? I will say the only language I've I've never seen personally doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But in 20 years, I've never seen something that says you are prohibited from working for me. But what I do see very frequently is the clarification that I am under no obligation to rehire you. Uh, this stems out of labor law contracts that provide rights like bumping rights and things like that. So it basically draws a line in the sand and says, as of this day, you have no special rights tied to your labor union, seniority clauses, anything like that. I am under, you have no, you bring no, if you come back and reapply, I'm under no special obligation to give you preference. So we need to address that because, again, that's victim blaming. I mean, that mm -hmm. it, it, it just put, tags a victim forever, continues to punish a victim. To say, to say well, but what it's trying to get at, and for better or for worse, is to what I don't want and what my client doesn't want. I don't want any more case. Is, well, to say, I, you allege sexual harassment, we don't believe it happened, you believe it happened, it's not worth going to court, here's some money. Line in the sand. The very next day, you apply for with for a job. I don't hire you for whatever reason. Let's even assume, for the sake of the story, non-discriminatory. Just we don't rehire you, and I've got a retaliation claim claim the next day. That's tied to say, and now I have to defend this all over again. And so the reason these sorts of clauses started was to say, you are now line in the sand today. Here's your money, and in trade for that, you are in line equally with everyone else, and that you don't have any sort of um, bumping rights or any priority. You don't come to the table with any special stance. You are equal to all others who would apply in the future. Or, or not equal because they know more about you and actually don't necessarily want you. I mean, theoretically, but if you're dealing with a company that is large enough for this to matter, I mean, UVM was an example that was used earlier. UVM in and of themselves has an HR team, and just the medical center alone has an HR team of approximately 75 people who all work. Recruiters work in surgery. Recruiters work in that, that these people are talking to each other, that these things are lined up, requires a lot more free time than those recruiters have, not to mention that this all got taken care of in legal, which is a totally different department. Compliance, which is a totally different department. When you are big enough to have enough people's hands in this, no one's carrying around this institutional if knowledge. If you're tagged as an, an employee, mm -hmm. and you've sure. got a tag, and it's going to go with you where, no matter who looks at you. It doesn't matter. They're not all talking to each other. But if you have a tag on your file, that's going to follow you. I mean, who, I, 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 well, can't, I can't say it doesn't. I'm curious about the tag, but we don't have, I mean, find you're identified as a pain, you know, somebody they don't necessarily want to hire again, that's going to stay on your file and be noted. I mean, 
I don't know if you've ever seen these files, like they're drop down box. I mean, to say someone's hireable or not rehireable, uh, it was mentioned earlier, to say you're not rehireable is retaliation. That's a whole nother thing. Um, usually these separation clauses talk about what this looks like. It's now resignation, it's now whatever. I mean, that's, a, that's an internal crossing. There's no sticky note that gets on someone's file that says, you know, this person makes a lot of complaints. Uh, that doesn't, doesn't serve anybody. Um, I believe that, oh, and just generally speaking about this law, something I, I just noted, um, I always, when I'm looking at these things, I like to look at what's the negative inference that's happened, what's the shadow of what we're doing. And I, um, without in any way negating the severity of sexual harassment as um, something that we need to work on in society, I want to look at um, what are we saying by silence, if you will, to race-based harassment or age-based harassment or whatever, that all of these things um, specifically call out sexual harassment in a very deep way. And what does that mean? For everything else. For everything else. I'm just generally concerned about what we're saying. Right, but we know when we try to bite off all those things. Sure, sure. Sure, <laughs> sure. fair enough. Over and over fair and over enough. again. So I just, don't noted, but I just wanted to point it out, but it, I don't know that that should necessarily slow you down. Um, it just gives us feel for next biennium. Sure, take it, run with it, I love it. Um, I think that is generally all. So again, I'm rushing through to well, save you some time, but. Thank you. Right. So I had a question. Was there a prohibition on questions? Well, no, sorry, I'm I'm arbitration. There's a prohibition on just our discussion. <laughs> Too much. There's, no, yeah. there's okay. no prohibition on questions. Okay, so um, I'm looking at page three, H one, and I'm wondering if this is the piece you're speaking to directly. Yeah. So an agreement to settle a claim of. Uh, Sexual harassment shall not prohibit, prevent, or otherwise restrict the employee from working. Um, so, are you uh, saying that you would prefer if that piece wasn't in there, or are you just saying that there might be a situation where someone could, as a result of this, receive a, um, a false retaliation? I'm, I'm saying that's why I think, you know, back in the 60s, 70s, I think that's why these things started getting in there. Um, what I might propose alternatively is uh, that you can keep in there that an agreement shall not prohibit it because that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, and then prevent or otherwise restrict is broad language that might actually cross over the I'm not under any obligation. So I think if we're concerned about saying uh, clauses that specifically say you cannot apply to me anymore, um, if you're concerned about that as being um, uh, the continual punishment, uh, I think it's a healthy compromise to say that we, uh, you shall not prohibit it, but otherwise remove, prevent, or otherwise restrict. As but I'm, I'm curious, if, if we're prohibiting it, why would we allow it to prevent or restrict? Um, because I'm wondering... Or, or if, we're, yeah. if we're saying you shall not prohibit, why are we, we allowing it to be prevented or restricted? So I, I took your point to be that um, someone could make a false retaliation complaint mm -hmm. um, if they weren't hired. And I think or if one, sure. that's always true. Someone could always make a, a false complaint mm -hmm. of any sort. But all this says is when you're making the NDA, you can't, you can't uh, prohibit or restrict. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm not so sure about how this enables more false complaints. Sure, so the clause that I believe, I mean, I remember talking about this back when this was just all an idea. I believe the clause that started this language uh, was in, in a way to respond to agreements that, in my experience, more frequently say something like, I'm under no obligation to rehire you. Um, I've never seen, although again, not saying they don't exist, the clause that says uh, it is, I'm pro you're prohibited from working here. Uh, the only time I've actually seen those is when we are dealing in frankly, a settlement with the harasser, which is to say, you will not darken my door ever again. You will not darken my door anywhere in any of my institutions. You are never welcome back again. But that's when it's the harasser. There um, isn't much reason to do that when it is the, uh, the victim, because that, that person wasn't the troublemaker. The harasser is a troublemaker. So I use these only when it's the, the uh, accused. I mean, yeah, the harasser. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I know we're we have yeah, to get Michael Bolton on the phone. So I'm wondering, do you supposed to be? Oh, that's why Trisha's come in. And, and so just, yeah, you just get to check it. Uh, I don't know if she. Is she, she expected to fall? She have the flexibility? 
I need. Well, I've got two people also driving up from Brattleboro. They're up. Sorry. Okay, and I'm. I need Thank to sadly you. just sit yes. yes. up on the bedside of the building for one minute. Okay. So I just want to hear, before we do that, I want to hear from uh, Tony Wall. Tom? Tom Wall. HR. Hello. Uh, can you just gather your testimony for the purpose of this morning of what the state's practices are vis-a-vis -vis these? NDAs and Dr. Uh Certainly, to the extent that I'm, I'm aware of them, I'll be happy to do that. I'm Tom Waldman. I'm the general counsel. You said that to Kelly, you're talking about I have not, but I have talking points that I will send. Right, that'd be real. Uh, I'm Tom Waldman. I'm the general counsel of the State Department of Human Resources, and um, I'm uh, here really to address just one provision of the of the bill, and that is the uh, the proposal to prohibit what are commonly known as don't park in my door provisions. And um, I am here really to speak from the employer's perspective, because the state of Vermont is one of the larger employers in the state. It's either the largest employer or the second largest. It seems to trade that position with the uh, University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, the, um, the, the state does use what are commonly called don't darken my door provisions uh, in settling uh, employment cases, uh, not as a regular, not 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 as a regular on a regular basis, but when they're necessary. And um, a as the other attorneys who work in the employment area have testified earlier, it's a very useful tool in settling these cases. Um, very often, there's much more going on in in um, in a, a discrimination case or an employment case of any kind than what meets the eye or than what's alleged in a complaint. And both parties to a case have uh, a myriad of reasons to, 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 see the, to, to want to see the cases settled. Um, and from the employer's perspective, um, being assured that this employee is not going to come back is a really important consideration and a strong motivator for settlements. So the state's concern is that uh, if the prohibition were in place, that there would just be much, much more litigation. Uh, many cases would go to trial, or I think as we heard from Mr. Cassidy, he wouldn't even take cases uh, if, if he didn't think he could settle them. Um, and then complaints wouldn't, wouldn't be heard at all. Um, the don't darken my door provision or the prohibition on future employment is um, something that very often is it is the deciding factor uh, in certain cases to buy peace going forward, um, and it's very much what an employer often pays for. Uh, I understand the concern that there is that there could be victim blaming. You know, I'm very sensitive to that, but I think that from a practical perspective, it's a very important tool um, in reaching resolution of a lot of these cases. Uh, and I, I think I see your point. I would say, um, and uh, I have no experience negotiating these, but I would imagine that silence itself is also something that, that people are, is a big motivator. And yet there are, um, there are provisions that say you can't prohibit somebody from going to the Commission on Women or uh, filing a criminal complaint. So silence is, is not, you're not able to buy complete silence. Well, the state, the state isn't able to buy silence at all. All of our settlements are a matter of public record. We, you know, we never, we never see my, silence. To my point. Um, so in other words, if you could offer total silence in NDAs, that would be a really big motivator for people who want total silence, but we don't. And similarly here, so if, if the only rationale you're offering is that people would really like to be able to prohibit victims from being rehired. That's not a big motivator for me um, because I think it's unfair to, to the victim. And if the only logic is that people would really like to be unfair to the victim. Well, I think that there are circumstances where it might be unfair to the victim, but I've only seen it used in, in, in circumstances. In my short tenure here at the state, I've only seen it used in circumstances where it really was a valid concern. You know, where there were issues other than the issues raised in the plaintiff's complaint. Um, can you performance can you, issues, um, uh, misconduct issues. 
Um, and it was very much in the state's interest to move on, to never, to not have to deal with this person again. Not in a punitive way, but in a, in a productive way, really, for both parties. Um, you know, the concern, again, is that if cases don't settle, court systems are backed up, judicial resources, scarce judicial resources are consumed. Um, you know, it, 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 there is a public policy, uh, there are public policy arguments on both sides with respect to the don't darken my door provisions. That's really, that's really my only point. Um, you know, obviously the administration and the state government, the executive branch supports the goal of the bill and you know, the, the governor's recent executive order on ethics incorporated sexual harassment, raised it to the level of an ethical concern. Um, the governor ordered that all of his appointees uh, have uh, sit for sexual harassment training. I'm a, I'm a gubernatorial appointee. I went through the training. Um, the Department of Human Resources has mandated that all state employees in the executive, plan, in executive branch have live training. That's ongoing um, the, through the CAPS, the Center for Achievement in Public Service. Um, and um, we have de designed and updated a, a training program on the prevention and identification of sexual harassment. So the goals of the bill are something that the Department of Human Resources supports really, really strongly. Our only concern uh, is this one provision, yes. because we think that it really does take away a very useful tool that's used only when appropriate. Um, you know, we, the state can't use the tool to protect the harasser, because if there's a complaint, the State Department of Human Resources is under an obligation to, to investigate the conduct as an administrative matter. And there's a whole procedure in place for investigating employee misconduct and for imposing discipline. That goes forward regardless of what happens uh, to a civil claim brought by, uh, do you, do by a plaintiff. Do you use non-disclosure agreements at all? We do not. Okay. Did you give this testimony to the House? Same testimony, pretty much? Uh, I don't believe that we appeared before the House. Um, I, I know that the, the point was made by some private practice attorneys representing employers. So does the governor oppose this bill in its present form? Uh, only, that, only that one provision. But if this went through, does he oppose the bill? Uh, I don't know if the governor opposes the bill. Could you find out? I could certainly find out. Thank you. Uh, OK, uh, I think that's all we have on this one. Get Pat on the phone. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.